Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm Rosemary Blankenship, and I'm glad to be able to share a study on Psalm 23 with you today. The first scripture I ever memorized was John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You'll notice I recite that in the King James Version. I still do, after all these years, because that's the way I learned it. The second scripture I ever memorized was the 23rd Psalm, also in the King James. Perhaps it's the same with you. Perhaps this psalm is deeply imprinted on your mind and embedded in your heart. Even in a time when many of us have never seen a flock of sheep, much less known a shepherd, we still find peace and comfort in the words. We still teach it to our children, and we often recite it together as part of worship. I invite you to recite Psalm 23 with me now. I'll be reading from the King James Version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Often the King James Version sounds too formal or too stilted in our modern world. And I think it's good to read things from different translations. This may give us a new way of understanding a, a scripture and of seeing that text in relation to our own lives in a new way. Listen for a moment as I read a more contemporary version from Eugene Patterson, Peterson, author of The Message. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and send me in the right direction. Even when the way goes through Death Valley, I'm not afraid when you walk by my side. You revive my drooping head. My cup brims with blessing. Your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life. I'm back home in the house of the Lord for the rest of my life. In any translation, that first verse is a declaration, as in it we acknowledge God as our shepherd. We claim a relationship with him. And because of that relationship, we can declare that we want for nothing. Notice that there's a cause and effect there. Because God is our shepherd, we do not want. The Hebrew word that we usually translate as want is kasari, and means that there is absolutely nothing lacking. That's a pretty incredible declaration in our world today when it seems that all of us are anxious about what the next days and weeks will bring. You may want to pause this video for a moment and think about what it means to you to be able to declare, I shall not want. Feel free to journal your thoughts and responses. Verses 2 and 3 describe the reason why we want for nothing. It is because God has already provided what we need. He has caused us to lie down in green pastures. The picture here is of complete relaxation. This is not just a quick rest stop. 
a 10 minute power nap while you're sitting at your desk or in your recliner at home. This is settling down for a good long rest and feeling all your muscles and bones and joints relax and melt into all that soft fragrant grass. It is feeling completely safe and completely loved. The way a child goes limp in the arms of her mother or father and with a big sigh and a smile of contentment sleeps confident that everything is right with the world. Notice that the place where God brought us to rest is a green and lush place. This is important because sheep, according to James Limburg in his commentary on this psalm, are nibblers and can nibble themselves lost. They nibble a bit of grass here, they see another patch, wander over and nibble a bit there, find another patch this way, and go and nibble there. And before they know it, they're lost. But God has placed us in a green pasture in such a way that we have no need to wander off looking for more. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't mean that we don't sometimes wander. But when we do, the shepherd is there with rod and staff to bring us back. And God has given us still water to sustain us. All animals, sheep and humans, need water to survive. We humans can go without food a lot longer than we can without water. And it's important here that God led us to still water. Sheep, for all that they're very agile on a hillside, cannot drink safely from swiftly flowing water. They're likely to be swept away we too can be swept away by the flowing world around us. But God brings us to a place of stillness, a place where we can stretch out and relax, where we will have all that we need to sustain us, and where we can simply be in his presence. A few years ago, I spent four years on a wilderness retreat. Now, I have to admit that being in the wilderness in this context included a clean bed, private room, plenty of hot water, a dining hall with wonderful food, and an always freshly brewed pot of coffee. During those four days, each of us on the retreat spent a lot of time alone and in silence. We had been brought to a place where our immediate needs were met, and met abundantly, and where we could just be with God. There were trails to walk, rocks to sit on, grass to lie in, prayers to recite, and quiet, and time, time to hear God's voice. Right now we're in the midst of a very difficult time as our daily lives are completely disrupted, but it may also be an opportunity to grow closer to God. In all the noise of news reports, conflicting information, and anxiety that swirl around us every day, it may be hard to hear God's voice. But if we are intentional during these days of social distancing, we can set aside time to be with God and to tune our spirits and our minds to hear His voice. I invite you to pause for a moment now and think where your green pastures and your still waters are. I didn't know this before I began to study this psalm, but apparently sheep learn to recognize the voice of their shepherd. When a shepherd tends a flock, she talks to the sheep so that they learn to respond to her voice. In the Gospel of John, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one.
we can rest assured that when we are known by Jesus and listen to his voice, he will be present with us no matter what's going on around us. A shepherd does lead sheep with her voice, but you know, it takes time to get to know the voice. The four days that I spent on retreat helped me to be able to recognize God's voice in a way that I hadn't before in the midst of everyday life. And frankly, I'm trying to be intentional about using this time now of social distancing and self-quarantine to be still and to listen to what God may be saying to me. When we recognize that we are lacking nothing, we can stop and be still and be with God. And as the psalmist wrote, our souls will be restored. Often we may think of our soul as some inner part of us that's separate from our physical body. But the Hebrew word translated as soul is nephesh. That word does not describe a piece of a person. It describes the whole living being, body, mind, and soul. Spending time with our shepherd brings restoration to our entire being, physical as well as spiritual. That restoration is not just for ourselves, though. The next part of the verse tells us that God leads us in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Another way to translate that is, for his purpose. We are led in learning what is right and just, so that we may live in right relationship with God and with others. God's purpose is always to draw human beings to him, to bring each of us to a place where we can say with the psalmist in verse 4, Thou art with me. Peterson translated this as, You walk by my side. Pause for a moment and consider what God may be calling you to do in these upside-down days for his purpose. Life is not always easy or pleasant. The psalmist recognized this when he wrote about the valley of the shadow of death. Death is really too narrow a translation of the Hebrew word here. It means something more like a deep darkness, a time of great pain and tragedy. The usual translation of valley of death may be why this psalm is so often used in funeral services, and it is certainly appropriate there, because there is no more deep darkness than the love than the loss of someone we love. But the twenty third psalm is not a psalm of death but a psalm of life, of abundant life. It tells us that God is trustworthy in every situation. Thou art with me means that even in those deepest, darkest times in our lives, we are not alone. We will journey through that valley, and God will walk with us and bring us out into the light again. He will comfort us. God's comfort is not a quick pat on the back and a superficial, don't worry about it, it'll be all right. God's comfort is strength. In fact, the word comfort comes from the Latin word to strengthen. As God walks side by side with us through whatever our darkness might be, he gives us his strength. Walter Brueggemann wrote in his book, The Message of the Psalms, it is God's companionship that transforms every situation. It does not mean that there are no deathly valleys, no enemies, but they are not capable of hurt. The psalmist knows that evil is present in the world, but it is not feared. Confidence in God is the source of a life of peace and joy. Such a life of peace and joy are described in the last two verses of the psalm. These words paint a beautiful picture of God's abundance. God prepares a table before us, and we can sit down to feast even though we are in the presence of our enemies, even though we may be facing adversity. 
God anoints us. The anointing that the psalmist described is not a little small touch of oil on the forehead as we might do in anointing today, but it's more like pouring an entire pitcher of oil over a person's head. It's anointing that completely drenches. And God fills our cup to overflowing until the blessings run out of the cup, down over our hand, down our arm, and pool around our feet. That is true abundance, given out of God's love for you and for me. The last verse of the psalm speaks of goodness and mercy following us. To say that these things follow us is, I think, to diminish what the psalmist wrote. A fuller translation of the Hebrew is to say that goodness and mercy pursue us. Goodness and mercy are not meekly walking along a step or two behind us. They are running full tilt toward us, trying as hard as they can to overtake us and to capture us. God's goodness and mercy are immeasurable, and with them we will remain in God's house forever, in this mortal life and in the life to come. That is why I say this psalm is a psalm of life. The psalm ends with beautiful words of reassurance and of trust. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Look around you now for God, signs of God's goodness and mercy. They are there, even in these uncertain days. Begin to focus more on God's goodness and mercy, and less on the empty toilet paper shelves and the things we can't do right now. Know that through God's goodness and mercy, we have hope. As I said in a devotion posted last week, hope is not blind. It does not ignore reality. Hope looks around, sees what is happening, and chooses to look beyond this moment, to look toward the future, to look to possibilities and opportunities, to look toward God's love and grace and His constant presence with us. I invite you to take a few moments and consider, where do you see signs of God's goodness and mercy today? In these days of high anxiety and wondering where, when life will be normal again, I encourage you to allow God's goodness and mercy to catch up to you, to surround you, to sustain you, and to give you hope. I encourage you too to stay in touch with your family, your friends, and neighbors. Schedule a time to get together virtually and pray, sing, worship. Plan to watch the devotionals, the Bible studies, and the sermons available on the Fairview Facebook page with those in your household. Look around and see where you can make a difference in someone's life each day. Be the church wherever you are. Thanks for joining me. God bless you.